I'm Professor Glenn Thompson, the Academic Dean and Professor of New Testament and Historical Theology at Asia Lutheran Seminary in Hong Kong. On October 4th, 2018, ALS was honored to host on our Hong Kong campus Dr. Peter Williams, Principal of Tyndale House in Cambridge, England. Dr. Williams is recognized internationally for his research on the Bible and its original texts. In this lecture, he focuses on a matter that is both troubling to some Christians and a point at which skeptics often attack the sacred scriptures. In the Old Testament, the God of Israel at times sanctions and even commands his people to acts of violence against his enemies. Is such violence morally acceptable? Dr. Williams faces this problem head on while seriously yet reverently examining the sacred texts. ALS thanks Dr. Williams for sharing his expertise with us, and we pray that this lecture will bless all of you who hear it. Well, good evening all. It's wonderful to be with you and uh, such a privilege to be uh, giving this lecture and I'm very grateful to Asia Lutheran Seminary for putting this on. I've been very impressed uh, with this seminary, just uh, getting to know uh, folk over the last few hours and hearing about the work and it just sounds absolutely tremendous. And just say, if any of you are studying the Bible at higher levels, we would absolutely love to be in contact with you at Tinder House. Uh, we um, seek to promote research at the doctoral level and above, postdoctoral level. And um, we have people come from around the world. It's a great meeting place. Uh, we once had the head of religion in China uh, come to visit us and uh, were able to have a very good uh, discussion. And uh, we are able to get into many places that others uh, are not able to and uh, are looking to just promote uh, good biblical research. Now, the topic we've been given is about violence in the Bible. And if you want to find someone to disagree with, one of the good things you can do is go to the World Wide Web. And uh, here we have uh, a victim that I found uh, called Michael Runyon. I don't know uh, anything about him, except he wrote this uh, as, as, uh, on a skeptical site, the Bible's most obvious contradiction. Throughout the Old Testament, God is highly concerned about tribal issues, government, wars, and the capture of land and his chosen people including the taking of slaves and property from the surrounding tribes. Everything is focused on this life, in this life on the planet, and there's no concerns about the afterlife or the existence of any eternal consequences. But all of this changes with the New Testament. Now God's no longer concerned about politics and so on. And it's a, a, a typical narrative people have of the nasty guy Old Testament God and the nice guy New Testament God. And of course, what that does is it completely misreads the way the Bible is. In the beginning, God put two humans into a beautiful garden. Well, that seems like a pretty nice guy thing to do. In the New Testament, there's no one who speaks more about final judgment uh, than Jesus Christ. And you then get to the end of the New Testament, you see the terrible final judgment on those who don't accept him. In other words, it's not that we have, um, you know, lots of gifts uh, in the New Testament and nothing in the Old. In fact, what we have is, if you like, you could call it the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or, to put it in more contemporary language, the Old Package and the New Package, or the Old Deal and the New Deal. Now, I know we're not used to talking in that sort of way, but it's very clear that God hasn't changed, but he had a way of illustrating and showing us our sinfulness which is the Old Testament, which prepares us and prepares our minds for Christ and the grace that's offered in him. Now, I want to come to the, what I see as the biggest objection that people make about the Old Testament, and that is uh, that the Old Testament supports violence and genocide. And uh, this is the way I put the case against the Old Testament before I answer it. Firstly, that God, uh, in uh, the case of Joshua, commands Israel to go in, and it also happened in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, to go in and destroy other nations in the promised land. And this doesn't just include the adults, it includes non-combatants so, uh, uh, and also children. So that's uh, what the biblical text seems to say. Then we can say, well, it's always immoral to kill innocent people. Doesn't that seem to be incompatible with God being a God of love? 
And isn't it rather like all the sort of terrorist and religious violence we hear about in the world today? So that's the way things are being framed, and that's the question I want to look at. Now, there are many other questions we may want to look at at the end that relate to this, and I'm happy to uh, seek to field any of those, but that's uh, the thing I really want to home in on uh, just uh, tonight, is to look at the question of the destruction of the Canaanites and the other nations. Now, firstly, I want to find out whether you have any moral compass. Uh, so uh, I want to start with a, a question of, has anyone ever played this game before? It's called Let Me Out. H hands up anyone who's uh, played this game. So what we have is we have a golden piece here that wants to come out through this exit. But in order for that to come out, we have to move this piece up. But in order for that to go up, we have to move this one across. But for that one to go across, you have to move this down. Now, a lot of the time, uh, people say to us in our culture, I want an answer, and I want it now, and I want a quick answer, and I want a one-word answer, or a one-sentence answer. I want a sound bite. And to me, saying that is exactly the same as saying, I want you to do this game in one move. And the answer is, it cannot be done. But if you allow me quite a few moves, no difficulty. Everyone in the room could do it, I believe, right? So in other words, what's happening is we need to move a few pieces round in the way people think in order for the pieces to be able to fit. So it's not that there's a difficulty, but if the demand is, give me a one-sentence answer, give me a soundbite, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And that also means that we've got to discuss as we talk to people and find out whether they are sincere in the questions they're asking, in which case they should be prepared to listen for a little bit longer. And also we've got to ask our own selves, are we sincere in our dealings with them? So let's have integrity and the patience to do that. But I want to find out whether you are actually moral as people. So how many of you think it's uh, uh, always wrong to take innocent life? Let's just have a check. I mean, do we have anyone... The rest of you all are happy killing people. Yeah, is that right? Uh, I, I didn't know this about Asian culture. I'm just learning. Uh, so so how, many, how many of you think it's always wrong to kill innocent life? And the rest of you... <laughs> I'm just trying to look at people who are happy taking innocent life. Just uh, anyone? Okay, fine. Well... I want to argue that um, I want to make 15 points, like 15 moves, and this is move number one. That sometimes we accept people who plan to take innocent life as heroes. And my example of that, uh, I'll come to in a moment, but I just want to unpack it a little bit. The mere fact that someone commands or intends or undertakes the taking of innocent life does not mean that they're not good, nice, loving, or, to define that, preferring to give life. What is the example of this? It is at 9-11 when there were the terrible terrorists, you remember, who um, hijacked four aeroplanes. And in those days of ill preparation against terrorism, uh, the US scrambled F-16 pilots to intercept planes that might be used as weapons. And they weren't even armed at this stage. And two F-16 pilots were scrambled, one called Mark Sassville and the other Heather Penny. And they were given the task of bringing down aeroplanes that might be being used as missiles. And they have no missiles on board to take any uh, aeroplane down, so they decide that the only way to do that is to ram their own F-16 planes into one of those hijacked planes. Mark Sassfall said that he would take the cockpit and Heather Penny uh, agreed that she would take the tail. Now I want you to remember, of course, that this didn't actually go through because the fourth aeroplane came down by other means. But the point is, they intended to do that, and if they'd carried it through, they would have taken innocent life, because most of the people on the plane were not terrorists. Now notice this, when they came back down to land, they were not thrown into prison. There was no public outcry saying how totally immoral, in fact, their military careers have gone well. And I want to suggest more than just that their careers have gone well, I want to suggest that they are heroic. Because those people woke up in the morning wanting to do a good job, wanting the world to be a better place. And when they were called on, they were prepared to make a sacrifice of their own lives to try and preserve lives. Now, 
I'm not saying that that means that there's no moral critique that can be made. I'm simply saying that although people criticised President Bush, they never criticised him for this authorization. In the dealing of things, no one from either political side in the US or from anywhere in the world was saying that was an immoral thing to do. And I think that's a very interesting thing because it shows that intent really, really matters. Those people were wanting to do everything with every fibre in their body to make sure that as many people lived as possible. Now, another example, and uh, I don't know ones from an Asian context, so maybe you can give me some afterwards and I can use them next time. Um, but another example is during the Second World War, when uh, Norwegian commandos sunk a civilian boat which was carrying heavy water uh, which uh, was going to be used by Hitler for a super bomb. And of course, in order to do that, they couldn't warn the locals of what they were going to do. And again, I think if uh, one of those was known to you, you wouldn't be ashamed of knowing them or think that they were bad people. They were, in fact, intending to give life. Now, <clears throat> with our examples, there is a weakness. And the weakness is this. Did those people really have the moral authority to take life? Uh, does the US president even have authority to command such a thing? But of course, with God, that vulnerability doesn't exist. Because God is the giver of life and therefore its owner, and the only due authority who can actually command the giving of life. So therefore, we can use what's called an a fortiori argument, an argument from the weaker to the stronger. If we are prepared to accept the benevolence of Mark Sassville and Heather Penny as people who did something which would have resulted in the taking of innocent life, or if, if it had been gone through, and we're prepared to accept them as heroic, surely God is in a stronger position because he actually gave life in the first place. And therefore for him to end a life is simply to take back what he gave. Now I want to say that this argument also works even if you're with an atheist. Now the atheist says, I don't believe in God, so I don't count this argument. Ah, that is no excuse. And you know why? That is because God is a character in a book called the Bible. Now, if I read, say, the Harry Potter books, I can't judge the characters in the Harry Potter books not believing that Harry exists. For the sake of the story, Harry exists. If I read The Lord of the Rings, then I have to believe there's a real Sauron and there are hobbits and so on. In the story, in the story world of the Bible, who is the biggest character? The one who comes up the most? Uh, God. So in other words, if I'm going to be fair to this, to judge the characters in the story, I need to accept the existence of God. Even as an atheist, you have to uh, do that. And the point is, in the story of the Bible, the Bible begins with God making life, giving life, putting humans in a good position and so on. And so I'd want to say that an atheist should accept that that is the context in which everything else occurs. Um, so we can make that a fortiori argument, that God is the giver of life and therefore the only one who can command the ending of life. Now, should we take the, someone's life because we think it's a good thing to do. No. If we have an idea in our head that we should take someone's life, is that a reason to take it? No. If someone tells you to take someone's life, is that a reason to? No. If you're in a concentration camp and the guard tells you, you need to take the life of your colleague, should you? No. Because that guard has no authority to. There is only one person who can authorise the taking of life, and that is God. And I want to say that sometimes... Authorization changes a moral category. So here I have my credit card and I can give you a cre my credit card and say you can spend money on it and that's morally fine. But if you take my credit card without my permission and spend money on it, that's theft. In other words, my authorization changes things. This happens in all sorts of financial situations. You give someone your car keys and so on, it's different from them taking it. So if the person who owns life gives an authorization, that actually changes the moral category. Uh, it, it actually becomes okay. Now sometimes Christians, because we're very interested in um, resisting abortion, and I think that's good, that, that we should, 
we talk about the sanctity of life. Life in itself is sacred. I want to say that's a bit of a shorthand and not the most precise way. I think the most precise way is to talk about this. It's the not belonging to you-ness of life or the not belonging to me-ness of life. Life doesn't belong to me. No one else's life belongs to me. My own life doesn't belong to me. That's why I can't take someone else's life. I can't take my own life. It belongs to God. In other words, God is the only one who can take life, and to take life without his authorization is theft from God Almighty. Therefore, I want to define murder as the unauthorized taking of life. The unauthorized taking of life. Now, there's another difference with our F-16 pilots. That is, the F-16 pilots don't know the future. So let's say that the F-16 pilots had actually brought down the plane. Well, no doubt the families of the innocent people on that plane would have complained and said, some, some, well, some of them might have said something like this. How do we know that the good people on the plane weren't about to get back control? And you see, we're prepared to accept them as heroes, even though there is that weakness about what they know. But of course, that weakness does not exist with God. So again, we can make an a fortiori argument, an argument from the weaker to the stronger, if we accept that these people could be heroic even though they don't know the future. Well, God does know the future. And in the Bible story, God knows the future. And that makes a big difference. When my children were a lot younger, I would um, throw them up and catch them. One of the things that made that morally okay is that I had reason to believe I could catch them. If I didn't have reason to believe I could catch them, it would have been morally dubious, right? So in other words, your knowledge of the future makes a difference. Imagine you had all knowledge of the future. There are all sorts of things it might be rational and good for you to do, which would not be good for you to do without that. Now, that, now God is in a class of his own. He is the only one who has all knowledge. I'm not saying this is something that we can go and do. We shouldn't be trying to copy God in everything. We should be looking to copy God in the things we're told to copy God in and not in the other things. So uh, God has future knowledge and that absolutely changes things. In other words, in giving a command, like the command to destroy the Canaanites, he may have access to all sorts of information about what will happen in the future that no one else has access to. Now, a fourth point is this. None of this happens in a vacuum. It happens in the context of a story in the Bible of a good God, that God is a benevolent God. God's kind right the way through the Old Testament. And this is very important. If you're looking at judging something, you take up character references. And one of the supreme points at which God shows his benevolence is in sending his own son to die for us on the cross. In other words, um, although there is no soundbite answer on this question, if we are going to have a quick answer, it will be take, to take people quickly to the cross. That is one of the things we want to say is, um, you know, I want you to recognise that we're not talking about a God who sits up there distantly and gives commands about other people's fates and doesn't care about them. Actually, our own God uh, came in the person of Jesus Christ and suffered and died. And so we actually want to say that very clearly lots of times so that people understand we're not talking about um, a God who's untouched by our situation. I also want to say when we're reading the Bible, we need to remember that the Bible is full of miraculous stories. And you can't take the miraculous out of the story any more than you can take magic out of the Harry Potter stories and still have a story. Or take the ring out of the Lord of the Rings and still have a story. It just can't happen. God does miracles everywhere. And I must not read the stories of Joshua and the conquest without thinking about the miracles that are associated with it. In fact, the time of the Exodus leading up to Moses and so on is the greatest display of miracles in the entire Old Testament, such a cluster of miracles. But often when people attack the Old Testament, they launch two attacks simultaneously. Attack number one, it is not true. Attack number two, it is immoral. And I want to say that that double attack is unfair. 
Because whether or not it's historically true is irrelevant to the question of the morality of the story. I can judge the niceness or nastiness of characters in stories without believing that they're true. I can look at the uh, Homer's Odyssey, and when I'm looking at that, I need to think that, according to the story, Athena, the goddess, really does appear to Odysseus. I can't factor that out because it's miraculous and then start thinking of Odysseus. It's the same with any story from anywhere. You have to take it on its own grounds. So the point is, an integral part of the Bible story is that these are miraculous and you can't uh, bracket that out. Now, when my children were younger, I used to let them watch uh, Tom and Jerry. You have Tom and Jerry here? Yeah. Now, one of the reasons I was happy for them to watch this is I believe my children were sufficiently discerning to recognise that different physical laws apply in the Tom and Jerry universe. Uh, in, in other words, if they try and do this same thing to each other, different effects will arise. Or in the Disney story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and of course it comes back uh, before Disney's um, Duca, isn't it? Um, that uh, when someone chops the, um, the broom in two, they become two brooms, and so on. Now, one of the reasons we believe it's bad to stab people is that stabbing them causes them pain and tends to shorten their lives. Imagine, however, you were in a different physical universe in which stabbing someone gave them pleasure and lengthened their life. Actually, it would be the morality of stabbing people would be rather different. Some of you may have seen the film Prince of Persia. Have you seen that? Uh, where, where, again, you get different physical laws applying about stabbing people and time running backwards and so on. Now, all of which is to say, when we get to the Bible, and let's say the story of Abraham being told by God to offer up Isaac as his son, his son as a sacrifice, many secular people read this and forget about the miraculous. So as far as they're concerned, it's not that God has objectively told Abraham anything. It's that Abraham has sub sub subjectively got this crazy religious idea into his head that he needs to go and kill his son. His son, on the other hand, only has one thing, his life. That's all that anyone ever has. And when the life ends, that's it. So therefore, if Abraham plunges the knife, he's done an irreversible bad. Now, the real story goes like this. God has revealed himself miraculously and objectively to Abraham. This is real world. And in fact, Abraham has amazingly, miraculously had this son in his old age. What is more, God has said that through this particular son, Abraham is going to have more descendants than can be counted. Which means that I don't need to read the book of Hebrews uh, where it says that Abraham knew that God could raise him from the dead, to know that Abraham was thinking that actually, whatever I do with this knife, Isaac must continue to exist in such a way that he can have descendants. Right? Just from reading the book of Genesis, I can deduce that. So in other words, when we read it as miraculous, the morality of that becomes quite different. Now, of course, it's also important in the story that the sacrifice is called off and there is a replacement, a wonderful replacement. And this, of course, I believe is a great picture of Christ. So uh, because this happens, in fact, at the very place where the temple is founded and I believe you know, the place where Christ was uh, crucified and uh, the lamb is provided. So I think there's a tendency for people to read the Old Testament the exodus and the conquest without God there, but God's the main character, and you can't remove him or his miracles in the narrative. Sixth point, in these narratives, God did most of the fighting. Now, again, people read these narratives as if it's the Israelites telling about how they did all this war. But actually, read the story, and on the verge of um, going against Jericho, Joshua goes for a little walk, and he sees a man. And he says to the man, are you for us or for them? And the man says, neither. Uh, I am the guy in charge of God's army. In fact, not just the guy. He says, you know, take the shoes off your feet, which is exactly what um, Moses did when God appeared, because that character is God uh, who is showing himself. In other words, the person in charge of the armies 
was God. You look at how people uh, fought uh, there, and you realise that in the narrative, God makes the walls of Jericho fall down. God is the one who rains hail down on the armies opposing Joshua and so on. In other words, these are miraculous stories, which, by the way, means that, um, you know, uh, they're hard to imitate. So anyone who says that, you know, there's a risk that we might go and do this ourselves, well, that's not true if you think about uh, what actually happened. God is the main character doing the fighting, and he is inviting Joshua uh, alongside him uh, to do that. I'd also want to say this. We don't know that the Canaanite children were worse off dead. You see, in the, in the narrative, the Canaanite children are being killed by their own parents. Their parents are into child sacrifice. There is a, already a child welfare problem uh, in this situation. We do not know that this isn't simply going to end that in the least painful way uh, of all. Um, we can debate what happens uh, to these children after the death, we, but we simply don't know that it's necessarily worse than their life. Eighthly, the command is given with lots of objective evidence. Now, what I mean is this. A lot of people read this as if people are getting mad religious violent ideas into their minds. Now, of course, this is what happens with uh, Islamist terrorism, where people with no authorization from God in any objective way get into their heads that they need to go and kill people. Um, the, the terrorists at 9-11 had no miracles. They had not dried up the Hudson River as they walked around the Trade Center uh, so many times. Uh, none of this uh, was anything other than what they had come up in their own minds. They had no authorization whatsoever. On the other hand, in the narrative, the number of people who come out at the Exodus is huge. I believe it's the most carefully counted number in the Bible, and it says this. 603,550 men, right? They're counted in a book called Numbers, which is about counting people. And it's showing you how the promises to Abraham that he would have so many children that they couldn't be counted are partly fulfilled because he's got so many children, but not completely fulfilled because you can still count them. And this huge number of children, 603,550 men, are carefully counted over several chapters and all the totals add together. Now, that means not just the men, but also the women and children add up to a very large number indeed. And according to the narrative, these people hear God boom the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. All of them hear that. In other words, that is a very well-witnessed event. They all see the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. There is a huge amount of verification that God is at work. They see the plagues. They see the drying up of the Red Sea and so on. That means that they can have no doubt that God is authorising Moses and that God is authorising Joshua. Now, let's think about things that are witnessed by large numbers today. Sometimes when uh, Britain has a royal wedding, lots of people watch that. But how many people see it firsthand? Actually, very few. A few hundred, perhaps. Maybe a few thousand. But the rest all see it relayed by screen. A big sporting event. How many people see it? Well, maybe in a big stadium, a hundred thousand, maybe a bit more. The rest have it relayed by screen. In other words, there were more people witnessing the miracle of God speaking the Ten Commandments than any modern event. In other words, this is something which has a large amount of epistemic warrant. That's a posh way of saying reason to believe. Okay, a lot of reason to believe. Um, so as much reason as you have for believing almost anything that you believe about history, about geography and so on, there are more witnesses to God's validation of Moses. In other words, this is objective. It is not a crazy religious idea within the mind, according to the story, and even if you're an atheist, you have to take the story as a serious story, even if you're a skeptic, that's the way the story is. According to the story, this has a lot of objective reason um, to, uh, given 
with the command. And that's very important to recognize that. Ninthly, according to the narrative, the Canaanites are wicked. They are not um, uh, good people in fact. It says that they are sacrificing their own children. By the way, if anyone wants this PowerPoint, um, I'm very happy to leave it with the seminary and you, you can have all, all, all these slides for personal use. Um, so, but they were sacrificing their own children uh, and uh, it says in Deuteronomy, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates, uh, they've done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Um, so there are wicked people, that has to be factored in. And it's not just that the Israelites say they're wicked. Again, you can't do that with a story where you change the story and then judge it. According to the narrative, if we're judging the morality of the people in the narrative, the, um, the characters in the narrative, we have to take it as it stands. Tenthly, there may have been no reasonable alternative. Now, there are an infinite number of questions that begin, why did God, that we do not know the answer to. Because God has infinite knowledge and he's chosen to give us a limited share in that. And that's fine. We're not supposed to become omniscient. He stays omniscient. We're supposed to do what we can with our brains, right? Um, with his strength. Um, but what we can say this is God knows everything and he may know what will be the outcome of every single situation. Now, we might come up with a situation like this and say, well, wouldn't it be logical for the Israelites to destroy all the Canaanite adults, but to leave the children and to have some wonderful adoption scheme for Canaanite children? Now, God may know what would result from that. He may know that you can't do that in that particular society. And what would happen is those children would rise up to avenge their parents and that there would be 314 years of war resulting in this many deaths and so on. Now, I'm not saying the Bible says that, but I'm just saying if you allow that there is an omniscient God, a God who knows everything, then it's absolutely reasonable to say, I can trust him to have made calculations about what will be best. I, I can't do that myself. And the burden of proof is on anyone to say that is not the case. In other words, um, you know, anything else may have resulted in uh, you know, greater pain. So sometimes um, a loving person inflicts pain. A loving surgeon may chop someone's leg off. Why? Well, do they like chopping people's legs off? No, but it's better than the alternative. And in the same way, we should allow that God uh, does this in time. Ultimately, the Bible teaches us that he will bring everything into an ultimate, final, just judgment. But we understand that also this is his world and he can step in and uh, chooses to do so. So what if this move uh, put an end to child sa sacrifice by the Canaanites? What if over the centuries, if it had been carried out, it, it resulted in the death of fewer children? Eleventhly, it's important to recognise that Israel is in a unique position as God's judicial representative. They are judge on behalf of God. Uh, that's not a position any nation is in today. So what we can't do is read these texts and think, I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to be part of God's plan to judge another nation. No, this is at a unique point in history. Now, it's funny that people have more problem with the destruction of the Canaanites than they do with the flood of Noah, where, of course, at that time, God judges directly. People have more of a problem with him using humans to judge other humans than they do him judging directly. But that's not particularly logical for them to do so. If God uh, um, may judge directly, and of course he can, it's his world, then he may also use his creatures to judge other creatures. But that is a different situation from any today where no one has that authorization. An important point can be made twelfthly, and that is that the Canaanites were warned they had the opportunity to repent. I want to begin with the story of Rahab. You remember in the book of Joshua how just before the destruction of Jericho, the spies go to Jericho and it's as if the camera goes into slow motion because suddenly you get all of this focus on one particular woman, a prostitute, and her search for God. And she says this to the spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now, if she can know that, everyone can know that the Lord has given them the land. 
and that the fear of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Notice that way, fr phrase, melt away. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and then there was no longer uh, no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and on the earth beneath. So notice she says that all of the inhabitants of the land have heard of God's miracle drying up the waters of the Red Sea. Now that's a really interesting thing because that means God has testified miraculous things to them and she has recognised on this basis that God therefore must be the possessor of heaven and earth, of everything. Now, if she can recognise that as a prostitute based on the evidence, surely everyone is able to recognise that. Three chapters later, we have a different body of water being dried up. It's the uh, drying up in chapters uh, three and four of Joshua of the Jordan. And this is what it says. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan. Notice it's not that they heard that the waters of the Jordan had been dried up. They heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan uh, for the people of Israel until they crossed over. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. You notice those same phrases. God says in the Bible, at the testimony of two or three witnesses, let something happen. And before he goes in to um, uh, conquer that land, he gives two miraculous, big miraculous witnesses, two miracles of massive size that everyone in the land hears. And what does the king of Jericho do? What does everyone else do? They decide to shut the gates. Now, we don't know what would have happened had they opened the gates, except we know this. When Rahab sought after God, she found God. In fact, according to the narrative of the Bible, she became uh, a, an ancestor of Jesus Christ, who has Canaanite DNA, as well as Israelite <laughs> DNA, and uh, that has all rolled into our salvation through Christ. So in other words, God is not against Canaanites per se. In fact, we can say a bit more. The, the camera goes into slow motion, not just about Rahab, but also about another character called Achan, who is an Israelite. And by the way, if you mix around the letters of his name, you get something pretty close to Canaan. He's an Israelite who gets identified with the Canaanites by trying to take the stuff that was theirs. And he, in fact, comes to an end. And so it's a very interesting thing that it's saying, you know, it's not about race. It's not about ethnicity. If you're a Canaanite, you're absolutely doomed. Yes, God has declared that judgment must come on Canaan. But he also shows with these two examples how an Israelite is doomed when they turn away from God and how the um, Canaanite, when they turn to God, is saved. So in other words, it shows us it's all about God's justice. And in fact, as you go through the entire narrative of the Bible, it's not just that the Canaanites are judged. The Israelites are judged many times. In fact, the northern kingdom is judged and thrown out of the land. The southern kingdom is judged and thrown out of the land. In other words, anyone who defiles this holy land, God's land, has to be thrown out. Now, we can also see, it's not just those, but also the Gibeonites themselves report. Um, these are people who pretend to have come from a long way, but haven't come from a long way. They report how they've heard of all that God has done in Egypt and so on, and they come and try and become attached to the people of Israel. Of course, they do that in trickery. There's a partial judgment on them uh, in becoming servants, but there's also uh, a salvation for them in not undergoing the judgment. Thirteenthly, I've been talking about death of innocence, but of course no one is ultimately completely innocent. It's got to be understood in the context of all of Scripture that everyone has turned away uh, from God, Genesis 6 says that this happens from their youth. And so that's a factor that needs to be thought about when we consider this. Fourteenthly, I've touched on this already, you couldn't imitate these stories if you tried. There isn't a risk that someone reads the stories properly 
and then goes out and does stupid things. Of course, they may read them badly and do stupid things, but we can't stop people reading things badly. You know, people may read all sorts of things badly and do stupid things. I'm sorry, but please don't, you know, blame people for doing that. And by the way, if you are going to blame the Bible for what people do in the name of the Bible, are we also going to be fair with other books? For instance, if people read Darwin and then they get into eugenics, are we happy to blame Darwin for that? And most secularists say, no, 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 you mustn't do that. That's not fair. Okay, if, if that's not fair, don't try and blame the Bible for what people do in that name. So let's just have a, a parity, a fairness in the way that we look at consequences that come from books. Um, now, often people make an objection and they say, I can't believe it because of this. Why does God dis uh, command the destruction of the Canaanites? And I'd want to say that an objection can't be a question. A question is simply a question. And there's an infinite number of why did God questions that we don't know the answer to. Why did God do all sorts of things? I have no idea. You know, but um, if he's got a super big brain and I've got a super small brain, then it's pretty rational that he would know things that I don't. So that's not a reason not to believe in him. You know, I mean, any more than the fact that the child who's two doesn't understand why their parent is taking them away from the park is a reason for that child to doubt the benevolence of their parent. The parent may have all sorts of very, very grand reasons, or not so grand, for taking them away from the park. So if someone wants to make an objection, it has to be like this. There could not possibly be any morally sufficient ground for a benevolent, all-knowing and all-powerful God to allow the particular thing. Now you try and demonstrate that statement, it's going to be absolutely impossible to do it. To say, I can show there is not any reason that an all-loving, all-powerful God could have to that. say that. Now, some people say, yeah, but when you use the word good, you use it in a slippery way. Because you say, whatever God says is good. So can't he take bad things and call them good, and good things and call them bad? In other words, he wins. You're cheating. No. Because when we as Christians use the word good, we are not saying God can take anything and declare it good. In fact, we who believe in the omnipotence of God do not believe that God can do everything. In fact, we believe there's an infinite number of things that God cannot do. He cannot make a God bigger than himself. He cannot break his word. He cannot make one God, two God, three gods bigger than himself. He cannot make himself not exist. You know, all sorts of things he can't do. And so what we mean when we say he's all powerful is that he can do everything he wants to do and in big and powerful ways. Everything consistent with his character. Now, one of the things about the Bible is the Bible tells us that God is life. In him is life. There's no life elsewhere. And all life comes from him. He's the living God. And the Bible also tells us he doesn't like death. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So actually, that gives us a definition of goodness. And I use this right at the very beginning. Someone preferring to give life. We can maintain that God is always someone who prefers to give life. Why does he do that? Is that because life is a principle above him that he has to obey? No. Because he is life and life is an expression of himself. So in other words, of course he prefers giving out, allowing other people to exist as he exists, rather than terminating existence. He, he is joy. He prefers giving joy to pain. He prefers people living with his laws rather than disobeying them and going against him. So in other words, we can understand that God is benevolent in a real sense. God is someone who prefers to give life. But when someone tries to run this and say there is no possible ground that someone who prefers to give life could possibly have for allowing something, then I'd want to say you really can't show that. And we've got all sorts of reasons in the storyline of the Bible for trusting that God is good, benevolent and kind. If someone wants to make an objection to the Bible, I think there are only four rational objections that can be made about this. And I'll go through them each. One is this, it was immoral for God, as defined in the narrative, 
to command the destruction of the Canaanites. Now, do you want to make that objection, to, to say it really was wrong of him to uh, do that? A second objection could be this. It was wrong for Israel to obey such a command, even if it was given that particular way. In other words, you're saying if you were on a jury and Joshua were on trial, you would condemn him and say he should have disobeyed God's command. Even though God's so big and had shown so much generosity, he should have disobeyed that command. Is that the objection you want to make? A third objection could be this. Reading the Bible causes people to be violent. Now, there's a problem with this objection. Um, and that is that most people who make this objection aren't so worried about violence from video games and, you know, all sorts of videos and this sort of thing. And if we want to do this, you have to do some sociological work to do, you know, get your statistics together and demonstrate that causing the, you know, groups of people who read the Bible are more violent than people who don't read the Bible. Now, please go and do the research. I don't think you'll come up with positive results. I also want to say this. We know of stories of people who have been uh, turned from a life of violence because they've read the Bible. I, I know someone who used to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan uh, who came to Christ and is now uh, a wonderful, peaceful person who promotes interracial harmony. We know that in Bella Vista Prison in Colombia, one of the most violent prisons that there was in Colombia, uh, uh, people got together, started studying the Bible, many people became Christians, and it ceased to be a violent prison. Now, what we don't hear is lots of people sitting in prison, reading atheist literature, and therefore turning away from a life of crime. Uh, and so what I want to say is that this idea that the Bible causes people to be violent is quite ridiculous. In fact, we can show quite the opposite. And there's a fourth objection, and that is that and this is a different sort of objection. It's really a, a historical objection. And that says that the act of writing the Bible stories was propagandistic, and therefore they actually, actually twisted the material, and that makes the stories immoral, because the actual making of the stories was immoral. However, I do not know any national literature anywhere in the world which says as much negative about the people group it comes from as Israelite national literature. The idea that the Old Testament was written as propaganda for Israel is simply ridiculous. Now, we know what happens if you go to Egypt and you look at the monuments there. The monuments put up by Ramses tell you, tells you that Ramses is great. The monuments put up by Amenhotep tells you that Amenhotep is great. When you read the Old Testament, you can't say that the Book of Kings is written as royal propaganda. You know, uh, the kings don't come off very well there. In fact, there's not a single hero in the Old Testament who's mentioned at length without some critique, apart from possibly Daniel, possibly Joseph. Um, you know, actually, almost everyone comes off with um, implicit critique. So I'd want to say that this idea that this could be written as propaganda is simply ridiculous. So taking all of these things together, I believe that although the argument, the objection from violence in the Old Testament is widely made, I do not think it is at all a strong argument. It has rhetorical force, but it has almost no logical force. Logically, it can simply be taken apart. Now the question is, how can we then deal with things as we interact with people. And the answer is that none of these logical arguments I've been seeking to give will make any difference to people as you present them uh, if they're not open to being persuaded. And none of them will make any difference if our lives don't commend the love of God to people. So the, the plausibility of um, God as benevolent is supremely shown by Christ on the cross. And God's benevolent character needs to be embodied in his church, in the believers, who show that to friends. And if that is embodied, then everything else becomes credible. So these sorts of arguments can be made in the background, and I think it's good to make them to a group of, I assume almost everyone here is identifying as a Christian, can be made to a group of people to understand our own faith, and I think that's important. But actually what people who are non-Christians need to see is they need to see that we love them and also that we use our minds and we're prepared to give them uh, uh, answers where we can. So 
In all of that, I commend to you that the scriptures are very fair and God is very good. And I hope you've got some questions.